Now, dear ones, last week we had learned in the first six verses of Romans 14 just how important it is to understand Christian liberty for the general welfare of the church. And remember, I say that because from Romans 14 all the way through 15, Paul is having to reconcile weak and strong Christians who are very prone to judging one another in the areas of Christian liberty. So today, in Romans 14, verses 7 through 13, Paul gives a powerful admonition to both weak and strong Christian alike. What he's going to tell us to do is that we ought not to judge another Christian in the arena of Christian liberty. Okay, now here's the risk. What we're going to learn today is that if we are going to judge other Christians in the arena in which they have liberty, we end up usurping Jesus Christ and making ourselves the lawgiver of the church. And when that happens, and we've seen this happen firsthand, what you get is two things every time, false teaching and division. What happens when some false lawgiver gets a hold of a congregation and usurps Christ? You get false teaching and division every single time. And I think that that's why this message is so important. Now, as I say that, we can judge, as I'm going to show you, doctrine and deeds in light of Scripture, things that we're bound to. We can judge those things according to Scripture. We can even engage in church discipline if necessary. But we are to never judge brothers and sisters in the area of liberty. And we'll see why that is as we proceed. So with that, we begin in verses 7 through 8, where we see that all believers belong to the Lord. Now, let me explain why Paul wants us to understand that. If all believers belong to the Lord, why should you and I stand in judgment over their liberty? God is going to handle that. Christ is going to handle that. That's the point. So listen to what Paul says. He says, he says, For not one of us lives for himself, and not one dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord, or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Now, dear ones, notice here in verse 7 that no believer lives for him or herself. Okay, now you have to remember that you and I, the moment we came to faith in Jesus Christ, we were a new creation created by God, so that not only do we have our forgiveness of sins and the promise of everlasting life, but we also have implanted within us this desire to truly worship and glorify the God of the Bible. Now, this phrase also implies that no Christian is an island unto him or herself, meaning that certainly we are accountable to God in all that we do, even in the areas of Christian liberty, as we will talk about. But notice here in verse 8, Paul says, for if we live, we live for the Lord. Does everyone see the underline there? Again, that phrase is what's called a dative of advantage, meaning that if we live, it's for the glory of the Lord. It's for his advantage. But notice he also says, or if we die, we die for the Lord. It's also for his glory. But what's very interesting is look at the inference that Paul derives from that. He says, therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. We are the Lord's. Notice that highlighted in red. That's the key point. We belong to the Lord. Every believer. And so here's why Paul is accentuating that. If every believer belongs to the Lord, can you see why it's so wrong-headed for some Christian to judge another in the area of Christian liberty? We don't have the authority to do that, and we can simply say that's between them and the Lord. That's a phrase that I want to be upon our lips from today. When it comes to areas of Christian liberty, that's between them and the Lord. Why? Because at the end of the day, every Christian is going to be judged by Christ alone. And that's what we come to here in verses 9 through 11. Paul says, For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. But you, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. Now, dear ones, notice here in the beginning, we have an explanatory for. Does everyone see that in verse 9? For to this end, Christ died and lived again. Now, this idea of Christ dying and living again is an unusual expression. 
Because normally in the Bible, the way Paul phrases that is he says Christ died and was raised again. So why is he using this unusual construction? I think he's doing it because he wants to show the relationship between Christ's death and life and our death and life. He's doing it to show in the closest possible way the lordship of Christ over our lives. Now, notice, in fact, in the purpose clause, notice he says that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Now, let me grab a quick drink. But as you're sitting there, you're probably thinking, wait a minute, did Jesus have to earn his lordship over us through his work? Didn't he, wasn't he always Lord? Well, let me explain that. If we do our theology right, we know that the Son, the second person of the Trinity, has existed as God and with God from all eternity. And so he was always Lord. But practically through the incarnation, when the Son becomes man, truly God, truly man, he works out this salvation on our behalf through his incarnation, his perfect life, his substitutionary death, his resurrection and his ascension. And so one scholar likes to put it this way, it's the relational lordship. It's how it affects us. Jesus did his work so that you and I as believers can be a unique people unto him. We really do belong to the Lord. We really were purchased by his blood. Now, here's why Paul's driving at this. Notice in verse 10. Verse 10, Paul says, but you, why do you judge your brother? Now, remember, this is going to be particularly relevant for what? The weaker Christian. The weaker Christian is prone in judging the stronger Christian in areas of Christian liberty. But notice he doesn't stop there. He says, or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? Now, that's Paul's admonishment to the stronger Christian. So notice on the screen the boxes. Notice the judgment and the contempt. Back in Romans 14, verses 3 through 4, we saw that we Christians are prone to judging the stronger, and the strong are prone to looking with contempt at the weaker. And what Paul is saying is, why are we going about this? Who is any Christian to look down and determine the ultimate destiny and relationship of another believer with their Lord and Savior? Dear ones, we can't do it. This, the, every believer belongs to their Savior. In fact, not only should we not do it, we don't need to do it. Notice what he says next. He says, for we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Now, notice this phrase, the judgment seat of God. This is synonymous with the judgment seat of Christ that we see written about in 2 Corinthians 5.10. So the judgment seat of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.10, is identical to the judgment seat of God that Paul's talking about here in Romans 14.10. Now that's important because if Jesus is judging you, God is judging you. Although here when he says that we're going to all stand before the judgment seat of God, he's probably referring to the Father. So if Jesus judges you, why does he do that? He does it on behalf of the Father, he himself being fully God as well. Right? Now, in the applications, I'll explain what happens at this judgment seat. You'll find out it's not a judgment seat for damnation versus eternal life, but it has to do with what kind of reward we get. Now, to prove that indeed this has always been the case, that every single person, even believers, will end up answering to God, Paul cites the Old Testament. Does everyone see that in all caps? It's a blending of Isaiah 49, 18 and Isaiah 45, 23. Let me just cite it. Isaiah 49, 18, he says, As I live, says the Lord. Now stop there. One question is, why does Paul add that to Isaiah 45, 23, which comes next? Well, the reason I think he's adding that is he knows the scriptures. He knows he's adding it. But he's adding it to show the relationship between the Lord who lives and Jesus who lives in this passage. He's, he's linking this to Jesus. Now I say that because notice here in Isaiah 45, 23, it says, Every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. Do you realize that in the original context, that had to do with Yahweh? But we know here and also in Philippians 2, 9 through 11, that's applied to Christ. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of the Father. So what that shows you is if this can be applied to Yahweh and it can be applied to Jesus, Jesus is Yahweh. 
he's God. So another very important reference that proves the deity of Christ. Again, brothers and sisters, Christ alone is our judge. And what that should do is it free, should free us all to say, hey, I don't have to worry about judging a brother or sister in the arena of their liberty. That's between them and the Lord. Christ is going to be the judge in all things at the end. Okay, so as we continue on then in verses 12 through 13, we see that we are not to judge our brethren. Paul says, so then, here's an inference, each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. Now, dear ones, notice here we have two inferences that Paul draws. The first one is a so then. Does everyone see that? And then notice in the red, there's a therefore. Let's begin with the so then. Paul's first inference is that every single believer is going to have to answer to God at the judgment seat. Okay, now, this judgment seat is called the Bama Seat Judgment. And what is going to happen there for every believer is not God determining whether or not we go to heaven or hell. That's already been decided the moment that you trusted upon the Lord Jesus Christ. But what's going to be at stake is the amount of reward that you will have from God that is from Christ for all of eternity. Okay, so that's what he's talking about. That's the way in which we're going to have to answer to God, even as believers. But from there, he comes to his main inference. Notice the therefore. Anytime you, should, you see a therefore, what should you ask? What's it there for? Well, here's what he says. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore. There it is. If we belong to the Lord and we're all have to, going to have to answer to the Lord, even in the areas of Christian liberty, let's not judge one another anymore. Let's leave it to him. Now, that, of course, would be particularly relevant to the weaker Christian who was prone to judging the stronger. But here, I think it's for everyone. And again, notice after that, he says also that we're not to put a stumbling block in another believer's way. That would be particularly relevant for the stronger Christian. Now, I'm going to focus on that stumbling block issue next time because this is a transitional verse, verse 13, and that's the subject matter for the following verses. But the main idea in the verses we've just covered is this idea of not judging one another anymore. So let me lay this out as carefully as I can. What Paul's saying to us as believers is that you and I ought not to judge another believer in the arena of Christian liberty. Let me give you an example. I know some of you guys like watching football, and it's on Sunday. I do too, so I'm using this so you know that I'm, I'm on board with you. But let's say I were to come and judge you. I was some pietistic man, and I came to you and said, you shouldn't be watching football on Sunday. Where in the scripture under the new covenant does it say, thou shall not watch any NFL games on Sunday? It does not. And our Sabbath rest isn't found on a Sunday. It's found in Christ. So you know what? You have liberty. Now, I'm not suggesting there may not be a better use of your time than watching NFL games. By the way, I waste my time doing it too. But the grand point is the same comes forth. That's between them and the Lord. Because at the end of the day, every motive of your heart, everything that you've ever done, is going to be used at the Bema seat where you're going to be given reward forever. Heaven and hell, that's already been decided. You're in heaven the moment you trusted in Christ. So that's why we are not to judge people in the arena of liberty. That's between them and the Lord. But... We do have the right to judge doctrines and deeds that are bound under the new covenant. If some joker came in here, said that he had the right to cheat on his wife, or she, some woman came in and said, I have the right to cheat on my husband, or we can judge that. We say, no, you are bound under the new covenant not to commit adultery. And in fact, we can even, how would we proceed with that? Well, we would follow Matthew 18. We would go to them individually, privately, saying, hey, this is sin trying to win our brother or sister. And if that didn't work, what would we do? At Matthew 18, we take two or three witnesses so that by two or three witnesses, every fact could be established. Well, what if that didn't work? Then we'd have to proceed to telling it to the church. So we would follow Matthew 18. So I want you to understand that this prohibition against judgment in no way prohibits us from doing church discipline. 
That's part of God's gracious plan for his church too. So Paul is specifically saying that in the arena of liberty, that's what he's covered. Remember, one man views one day above another, another man views each day alike. Each must be convinced in his own mind. In that arena, we have to allow liberty. You and I were saved by the Lord Jesus Christ not to be under more bondage, but to have liberty. And one of the worst things that can happen to a church is you have some false lawgiver who starts giving their laws. Christ is on the outside of the assembly, and the false lawgiver gives false commands, false teaching, and divides the body of Christ. What does a false lawgiver lead to? False teaching and division every single time. That's why the Apostle Paul is warning us about it here. Okay, now, let's move on to our applications. Sorry, I'm a little dry. I'm on some allergy medicine. It dries me up a little bit more than normal. I have two points here for you this morning. Number one, we must realize that all believers will give an account to Christ, not fellow man. Now, that does two things. Number one, it should motivate us as to how we live. We're going to be answerable to Christ, not to whether we go to heaven or hell. That's been determined already the moment you believe. But our reward is at stake. The second thing that it does, it should free us to say, look, so-and-so in their free time, in other words, in their area of Christian liberty, that's between them and the Lord. They're going to answer to God. No one's going to get away with anything. Let's let the Lord handle it. Now, the second thing that we want to look at is we must understand how dangerous it is to judge other believers. Why do I say that? Evangelicals in America, they can usually spot licentious behavior, but they can never spot the pietist who's the lawgiver. Why? Because they seem so pious. They don't do this, and they do do that. And they get a hearing in a church, and they will pound people, and people will glom onto them. Why? Because they're holy. But really what they're doing is they're judging Christians in their area of liberty violating the commands of the Apostle Paul here who speaks for Christ and they end up becoming the lawgiver of the church rather than the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the great danger and that's why I think this passage is so relevant particularly to the church in America at large. Okay, so with that let's begin with our first idea. What I want to do is I want to first of all talk about there's two different judgments. Now why? Well in Romans 14 10 today we saw that every Christian is going to be before the judgment seat of God. Okay, remember I said that's synonymous with the judgment seat of Christ. Now, some people infer from that that this is a judgment in which every person goes to. That the judgment seat of Christ is where believers and unbelievers alike go to. It is not. It is a judgment specifically for believers. Now, let me lay this out for you. Let's talk about the two different judgments. First of all, there's something called the white throne judgment. Okay, you read about this in Revelation chapter 20. I'll show you a blurb from that. But here, this white throne judgment is only for unbelievers, and what is at stake is not whether or not they go to heaven or hell. That's been decided. These are people who are on their way to the lake of fire. But what's going to be decided, I believe, is the amount of torment that they will receive unto all eternity. It's very frightening. But that's not the judgment that Paul was referring to in Romans 14.10, about the judgment seat of God. Here he was talking about the, what's called the Bama seat judgment. I'll explain what that is from 2 Corinthians 5.10. This is the judgment seat of Christ. Now, here, this judgment is only for believers, and what is at stake, is, again, is not heaven or hell. Why? Remember Romans 8.1? There is therefore no, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The moment you trusted in Jesus, there's no condemnation for you. You're heaven bound. You're, you have everlasting life. If your everlasting life isn't everlasting, well, then God was a liar. You do have everlasting life. So what's at stake isn't whether you go to heaven or hell, but it's the amount of reward. Now, let me show you a passage that illustrates the distinction in judgments. Revelation 20, verse 6. We're going to be coming to this in our study in Revelation. Dana Birkinshaw, who's probably here somewhere, he's also going to be teaching us through some of these sections as well about the millennial kingdom. Revelation 20, verse 6, John says this, Blessed and holy is the one who has part 
in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Now, dear ones, notice here the first resurrection. I color-coded that blue because that is synonymous with the Bema Seat Judgment. Notice it says, blessed and holy are those who have part of this first resurrection. Why? Because we will have no part of the second death. Now, let's remember that death in the Bible is not annihilation. Death is separation. There's a first death, which is physical death, separation of body and soul. When a believer dies, their body goes into the ground, but their soul departs to go be with the Lord. The unbeliever who dies, their body goes into the ground, but their soul goes to Hades, a place of temporal punishment until the lake of fire. Okay? That's the first death. But the second death is also separation, but it's a separation of all unbelievers from the presence of God in where? In the lake of fire. Okay, so that's the second death that everyone who has part of the first resurrection is going to miss. So when Paul today is talking about in Romans 14, 10, all of us as believers have to go to the judgment seat of God or Christ, he's referring to this first resurrection judgment. You and I are not going to be having any part of the second death. Okay, so we have to lay that out. Now, as I say that, there are two passages in Corinthians that give further information as to what this judgment seat of Christ looks like. We see it in 1 Corinthians 3 and 2 Corinthians 5. So let me put up the passage, the first one, 1 Corinthians 3. I'll read it and then I'll unpack it some. 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15. And again, this is going to give you some information about what that judgment seat of Christ is like. Paul says, Now if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it, because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Now, dear ones, here I want to set the context for 1 Corinthians 3. Let me explain what's going on. Do you remember that Paul was dealing with these rascals at Corinth who were starting to de deny key principles of the gospel, like the resurrection? That's why in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul has to reestablish the resurrection. But they were also denying that he was an apostle. They were saying that he didn't have the authority of an apostle. Remember 1 Corinthians 3, you had some were following Apollos, some were following Cephas, and some were following Paul. Well, what Paul does is he reminds them that he was the master builder. And he laid a foundation at Corinth. And what was the foundation? It was the gospel. The gospel is centered on the person of in the work of Christ. So no one could take issue with him and his apostolic credentials. Why? Because if any man built, they're building on what he laid down, namely the gospel. So this is why he says, notice in verse 12, now if any man builds on the foundation, what's the foundation? The gospel, the person and work of Jesus Christ. Now, notice the conditional language when he says, now if any man builds on the foundation, it's not the idea that, well, if someone happens to do this, it's more of if as is the case. He's anticipating everyone will build. But notice how you can build. There's two different ways. You can build consistent with the gospel, the foundation that Paul laid, or you can build in an inconsistent way. Notice he says you build with either gold, silver, precious stones, those are things, let's stop there, that are consistent with the gospel. Those are things that aren't removed by fire. But notice the next three items. These things are inconsistent with the gospel. Wood, hay, and straw. These are all things that will be consumed by fire. Remember John the Baptist said, I baptize you in water, but one who's coming after me will baptize you in the spirit and with what? Fire. He's going to remove the dross from his people. This is what it's referring to. That we're all going to answer where all of our works that aren't for Christ according to the gospel are going to be burned up. Now, 
I'm not saying that there aren't kind acts. I don't know how Jesus is going to do all of his judging, but he knows the motives of the hearts. He's going to do it perfectly. And the point is, if anyone's actions are not in keeping with the gospel, they're going to be burned up. Why? Notice verse 13. It says, each man's work will become evident for the day will show it. That's the day of the Lord. Notice, he says, because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. Now, notice verse 14. If any man's work, which he has built on it, remains, he will receive what? Reward. That's what's at stake. It's reward. If you're building consistently with the gospel, consistent with the foundation that has been laid, you'll receive reward. That's the idea. So notice in verse 15, you see it very clearly that our eternal destiny is not at stake. He says, if any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself, an adjectival intensive, showing this, the believer himself will be saved, yet so as what? Yet so as through fire. Dear brothers and sisters, the Lord Jesus is going to reward those who come to him. So at the judgment seat of Christ, what's at stake is not your eternal destiny, but your reward. This is why Jesus said, in his parting words in Revelation 22, 16, he says, I'm coming literally imminently. I'm coming quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according to what he has done. Isn't it interesting, the final words Christ gives us in Revelation is that he's coming and it's imminent and that his reward is with him. Why? Because we're all going to have to, even believers, answer at the judgment seat of Christ, not for heaven or hell, but for the reward we receive. That's what Paul's alluding to in Romans 14.10. Now, let me show you another passage. 2 Corinthians 5.10 talks about the judgment seat of Christ. It is synonymous with what Paul taught us today in Romans 14.10. Okay, so let me put the passage up in a little bit greater context. And let me read it, and I'll comment again. 2 Corinthians 5.7-10. through 10. Paul says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and here's the purpose, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now, the first thing we have to interpret when we're looking at this text is what does Paul mean by we? Notice all the we's that I have highlighted red. Well, in context, if you read it from the beginning of 2 Corinthians 5, you'll see that certainly the we are believers. Okay, now this is very important. When I say the we as believers, I'm saying it includes all believers, but it excludes everyone who's not a believer. So it's believers and only believers. Okay, now why is that important? Because notice... When you're at 2 Corinthians 5.10, it says, We, all and only believers, must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, stop there. How do we know it's only believers? Well, go up to verse 7. Verse 7 at the top, when it says, For we walk by faith. Do unbelievers walk by faith? Well, no. They walk by unbelief. Notice verse 8. We are of good courage. Are the unbelievers characterized by those who walk in this life by courage? No. In fact, they're cowards, and they end up having their part in the lake of fire because they don't believe the promises of God. Verse 9, Therefore we also have as our ambition, whether at home or present, to be pleasing to him. That's an ambition that first and foremost belongs to the believer. So clearly, the we that must appear before the judgment seat of Christ has to be believers, that's all believers, but only believers. Now, notice this term, the judgment seat. The term judgment is actually the term bema. And contrary to popular opinion, I don't think the bema here is a reference to the raised platform that they had in the Olympics. A lot of people will teach that. There's a raised platform that they had in the Olympics in which there were rewards given to the different runners or different athletes. Okay, now, that's a good image. That's exactly what happens. But I want you to understand that Paul is probably thinking of the typical Bema, how it's used in Scripture. For example, John 19, 13, Pilate is seated on a Bema. Okay, now he's not giving rewards out to runners or athletes. He's 
sitting in judgment. Uh, in Acts chapter 12, verse 21, we have Herod who sits on a bema. And again, he's not rewarding athletes. He's giving out judgment. So here's my point. I'm not saying that there's judgment here for heaven or hell. But my point is the reward is told to us by the context of the passage. So yes, Jesus is sitting on this judgment seat, this bema seat. But what we're be being judged for is not heaven or hell but what kind of reward we're going to be given. In fact, notice here in verse 10, right after the red, you see a so that. That's a result clause or a purpose statement. They're interchangeable. He says, so that each one, that's each believer and only believers, may be recompensed for their deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So here's, I want you to think about this. The reason you and I don't have to worry about judging other brothers and sisters in their arena of liberty it's because Jesus has it covered. But I tell you, as I studied this passage afresh, this made me gulp a little bit about what I do in my liberty. Because it is right to say that what we do does count for eternity. The way we serve the Lord, if it's in keeping with the gospel. And so there is a way to fretter and waste the days in an offhanded way, as the famous Pink Floyd once said that we can waste our days. And yes, it's liberty. We can do all sorts of things. But at the end of the day, even in our liberty, every motive of our heart, every thought, deed, and word will be disclosed by Christ at his judgment seat. It's sobering, but it's also a call to the church to say, leave that to the Lord. I had a friend who was a pastor years ago and he said to me, he said, you know, in my congregation, I have the sneaking suspicion that some of my congregants think that Christians can get away with something. And he was saying that because he said so many of the congregants in his congregation were so busy judging other people in the areas of liberty. And he said to them, don't you realize they're not going to get away with anything? All of us go to the judgment seat of Christ. That was my friend's point. No one's going to get away with anything. Sobering to us, but also a reminder, if it's the area of Christian liberty, that's between a believer and the Lord. Okay, so with that, let's go on to our final point. I want to talk about how dangerous it is to stand in judgment over another believer in the area of Christian liberty. I have personally seen this. One of the reasons why we're here today called Gospel of Grace Fellowship and not Twin City Fellowship is because of this very issue. We had false judging and false binding in the church. And what did it lead to? It led to false teaching and it led to division. That's what it leads to every time. We had to engage in church discipline with a couple who thought of themselves as the lawgiver, judging every Christian in the area of liberty. You can't knit during the service. You can't tell jokes. You can't do this. You can't do that. It sounds very pious. It sounds like it's so holy. But at the end of the day, what they're really doing is they're usurping Christ as the lawgiver, making themselves the lawgiver, and creating division in the church. That's what it leads to. Now, let me give you a further couple of reasons why we should not engage in judging other brothers and sisters in the arena of liberty. Number one, we don't know the heart. We don't know another brother's and sister's heart and why they do what they do in their liberty. Turn your Bibles, if you will, to Jeremiah 17, verses 9 through 10. I know many of you probably know this by heart, but it's a good reminder. Turn your Bibles to Jeremiah 17, verses 9 through 10. What I'm going to show you is that God alone is the knower of the heart. And the implication then is let's let him judge the motives of the heart. Jeremiah 17, 9 through 10. Notice in verse 9 of Jeremiah 17, it says, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Now, stop there for a moment. Notice the rhetorical question demands the answer, no one. No one except God. And that's implied, in, in fact, it's explicitly stated in verse 10. I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. So right there, we see that God alone is the heart knower. 
Now, I'm going to show you a passage here, 1 Corinthians 4. Paul was dealing with this. Do you know some of the rascals at Corinth were judging Paul, saying, well, he has ulterior motives for being an apostle. Well, Paul responds by saying, I don't even know the own motives of my own heart all the time. Why? Because the heart is so deceitful that we don't even know our own heart. And so that's what he said, I wait for the Lord's judgment of my heart, not my own. And then he said this to him, 1 Corinthians 4, 5, Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time. Stop there. What time? The 70th week of Daniel's coming, the day of the Lord. And when the day of the Lord comes, within the day of the Lord will be this judgment seat. Notice he says, but wait until the Lord comes. Stop there. Who's the Lord that's coming? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. He's the one who's the heart knower. Notice it says, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. Jeremiah 17, 10, God only knows the heart. Here we see in 1 Corinthians 4, 5, Jesus knows the heart. Jesus is God. He's the heart knower. And he's going to be the one, therefore, that can accurately judge us when we're engaged in our Christian liberty. So many times I've seen people break fellowship over simple misunderstandings over motives. People assuming bad motives of other people that they've never had. I've seen that numerous times. Brothers and sisters, that's the kind of judging that we must not do. When you and I are judging other brothers and sisters in that way, we have to remember only God knows the heart. Now, the second reason why it's so dangerous to judge other brothers and sisters in their area of Christian liberty is because it arrogates for ourselves, means we take upon ourselves the role that Jesus alone has as lawgiver and judge in the church. Again, we've seen this here. I uh, was demanded in our former church, and the reason for the split, that my wife should stay home. She can't work anymore, the lawgiver said. Well, show me under the new covenant where my wife can't work. Is it better to go on welfare? So it's these types of things that do real damage. Why? Because the scriptures aren't believed. The scriptures aren't exegeted. Paul's words fall on deaf ears as if these things are things we can just let slide. But no, dear ones, the reason it's so serious and dangerous to judge other believers in their area of liberty is because we aren't the lawgiver. And as soon as we start judging brothers and sisters in the arena of liberty, we become the lawgiver rather than Christ. In fact, listen to what James says, James 4, 11 through 12. James says, do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you who judge your neighbor? Now, dear ones, I want to unpack the logic here of James 4, 11 through 12. First of all, I want you to notice at the beginning in verse 11 that speaking against a brother or sister goes hand in hand with judging them. Okay, so I want you to put that together, that in some sense they're synonymous. If you're slandering a brother or sister, you've already judged them, is somehow less than you. So slandering and judgment go hand in hand, and then notice that if you judge a fellow believer, what are you doing in the text? You're speaking against the law. Now why is the judging of another brother and sister, especially in the arena of liberty, a judgment or are speaking out against the law? Well, because the law of Christ demands mercy. Now, let me prove that to you through James. Turn your Bibles to James chapter 2, verse 13. I want to show you in context how James builds this up. James 2, 13. Please turn your Bibles there. James 2, 13. So again, how is it that you, by judging a brother or sister, are speaking against the law? Because the law of Christ, he's our lawgiver, demands that we give mercy. Now, notice this case as it's being built by James, James 2.13. James says, for judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, fast forward here, turn your Bibles ahead to James 3.17. James 3.17. 
We not only see that, yes, the law of Christ demands mercy, but we see that true wisdom that comes from Christ demands mercy. James 3.17, please turn your Bibles there. Notice there it says, But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy. Notice it doesn't say full of judgment. It's full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. Why? Because Jesus Christ is the lawgiver. And it's Jesus Christ who on the Sermon on the Mount, he's on a mount just like Moses was on the mount. And Jesus is the one in Matthew 5, 7 on a mount. Bob DeWay was teaching us that Jesus is the lawgiver today in Sunday school. At the Mount of Transfiguration, he's exactly right. Matthew 5, 7, Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they should be those who shall receive mercy. Dear brothers and sisters, the church is the assembly of those who have received mercy. But what happens when false lawgivers come in with their judgments on believers is they usurp the assembly of mercy and they turn it into an assembly of judgment once again. We're put back into a bondage that Jesus Christ set us free from. In fact, notice here, the writer James says that the one who speaks against the law also judges the law. How do we judge the law? Well, because you're declaring the mercy that the law of Christ requires to be null and void by your judgment. Jesus requires mercy to your brothers and sisters, and you say, well, I have none of that. I'll give my judgments upon them in the area of liberty. That's the problem. And notice what James says after that then. He says, but if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but you're a judge of it. Here's the original sin in the garden. Now, you might say, wait, where in the garden, in, in the garden narrative in Genesis does it say that the original sin was to be a, a judge of the law? Well, didn't Satan say to Eve, you will be like God, knowing the difference between good and evil? Eve became a lawgiver unto herself. That's what lawgivers do. They become the lawgiver rather than the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why James says, notice in red, there's only one lawgiver and judge. And guess what? It ain't me and it ain't you. There's only one sheriff in town, as the old saying goes, and it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, that's why it's so dangerous. Oh, yes, it seems pious when a Christian will come along and tell another believer, you can't do this and you shouldn't do that in the areas where we have liberty. It's attractive. It sounds so pious. But at the end of the day, what they're really doing is they're taking the place of Jesus Christ on his throne, and they're determining for the people of God what is right and what is wrong, just as Eve did for herself in the garden. That's why it's so dangerous to judge other brothers and sisters in the area in which we have liberty. All right, now, if someone wasn't here last week, I talked about binding and loosing. Binding and loosing are absolutely essential to understand because that's how we know where we have liberty and where we don't. Where we are loosed under the new covenant, we have liberty. Where we're bound, we are morally obligated by the scriptures under the new covenant to do or to not do something that the Lord Jesus requires. That's given through his apostles and it goes to us. Dear ones, you and I are not going to get away with anything in our freedom we are one day going to have to answer to the Lord Jesus Christ for every thought, word, and deed. But let us not be those who judge other brothers and sisters in the area of liberty. Why? Again, because we belong to the Lord Jesus who said, Come unto me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. You and I weren't saved unto more bondage. We were saved unto liberty. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for giving us your word that we may not devour one another in your church. We thank you, Lord, that you are the Lord of the church, the one who sanctified us by your blood, that you purchased us forever. And Lord, we do thank you for revealing to us how to interact with one another. We do pray, Lord, that if we've had any heart of judgment against another believer in the arena of liberty, that we would repent from that. 
that we would put upon our lips, that's between them and the Lord. We also pray, Heavenly Father, you put it upon our heart that what we do is not irrelevant, but in fact is relevant forevermore because we will all come to the judgment seat of Christ. We pray that you would implant these things deep within us, enable us to persevere into that day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, please stand for the benediction. From Jude 24 and 25, it says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. I love that. We're blameless. To the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen. God bless all of you. Have a wonderful week.